I'm here at the Ohio National Poultry Show. It's a big deal if you love chickens. Just look at all of these trophies that would be given away to folks who are, well, enthusiasts about chickens. This show's been going on since 1956, and it's a place for people who are serious about breeding to bring their best quality stock and see what they win. It's considered the Westminster of chicken shows. And today's episode, we're going to introduce you to some of these unique breeds and discuss how you can get started raising your own. So gather your friends and family, and let's have some fun and look at some of these extraordinary birds. Well, I better put this back before they see it's missing. The Ohio National Poultry Show is a show for exhibition poultry. They come from all over the United States to, to show their chickens and see if they can win or not. I've been raising chickens since I was eight and I'm 52 now, so I've been doing this a long time and uh, it's still fun, so I, I love doing it. I've been showing, at least in poultry, for almost 18 years. It's really something that my mom and I started together. Um, I like getting together with all your friends from all over the country. It's really cool to come to a big show like this and see everybody. Um, it's fun to compete with your friends. So this is the Wyandotte Breeders Rhode Island Red Club, um, and these are all just badges that I want. This is serious business to the chicken people, and we're here to win. That, 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 I mean, yeah, we're, we're pretty dang competitive. Well, for some people, it's a just kind of like a backyard fun type of thing, but other people take it a lot more serious than that, you know? Okay, we've got what they call a standard of perfection. The APA and the ABA both have their standards. And a judge starts out by looking for the type. Then he looks for cleanliness, how the breast is, the wings, if the feathers are all in or not, comb, eye color, leg color. They do wash their chickens and they prep them, they hair dry them, they do groom them it's just like you've got to groom a dog. They do that with chickens. Getting um, the, the, any kind of debris off the feet so the feet are clean when the judge picks them up. There's 400 different varieties and breeds here. There's ducks, there's geese, there's turkeys. We've got uh, cochins, big cochins, the barred rocks, the Rhode Island reds, white rocks. We've got Polish. We've got silkies. We've got all different kind of chickens that they don't normally see. We've got 200 kids participating this year in the kids show, junior show we call it. And they're just as competitive as the adults. I think showing is fun. It just kind of gives you kind of a rush when you see that you won something or even if you didn't just knowing that someone else look at your birds to see how they were and possibly give you feedback as positive experience. And it brings out the, their personalities. They learn to talk to adults. It'll give you experience to take care of other things that aren't just you and responsibility of making sure they have food, they have water, keeping them everything clean with them. So it's just a great experience overall. The atmosphere is fantastic. The people are great. They're super friendly. You can just stand around and talk to people all day. I have so many friends here. I've been doing this so long that I look forward every year to seeing them. And like this show in Ohio is so big. Everyone comes here. I just talked to two friends from California that I only see once a year or once every other year. It was, it was great. You'll never see anything like this anywhere else in the United States. Still to come, poultry enthusiast Ryan Carey discusses the best way to start your flock. And a little later, the importance of conducting a census for heritage breed conservation. For over 4,000 years, chickens have been providing us with, well, meat, eggs, 
a lot of entertainment, and I have to say, beauty. Chickens comprise over 20% of the animal protein we eat. You didn't want to hear that, did you? With some concerns over how industrial poultry is produced, the popularity of raising a backyard flock is on the rise. And let me tell you, the taste and texture of a freshly laid egg is something everyone should experience. Outside of the commonly asked question, what breed should I get, like these New Hampshire Reds, which by the way, lay a beautiful dark brown egg, the other question is, where can I actually find the birds? My good friend and poultry enthusiast, Ryan Carey, stopped by the farm recently, and we discussed the best and most practical ways for enthusiasts to get started. So what do you think of that one, Ryan? It's a pretty nice bird. Yep, well, these Spanish are, you know, they're really hard to find. We always have a lot of interest in them because of this amazing white face that they have. There's a lot of curiosity about that bird. Yes. Of course, it's a really old one. It's a foundational breed. It is, it's foundation of all Mediterranean breeds. It uh, dates back to the Roman times. They yeah, they the actually, clown chicken. they wrote about, yeah, the clown chicken, yes. that white face, yeah. Yep. So let's say someone's interested in finding high quality heritage birds. You know, you've got hatcheries, of course, you can order from. There's uh, breeders, um, they're, they're in, uh, hobbyists that, that just have them. Uh, what do you recommend for someone who really wants some top grade birds? Avoid the hatcheries. Um, yeah. Hatcheries are more concerned about production, mm -hmm. um, mainly egg production, because they're selling hatch hatching eggs. Right. Um, I would recommend you, uh, you find uh, a good reputable breeder um, or uh, check with the American Poultry Association. They have lists of breeders. Um, if you join the APA, you'll get a yearbook every year talking about uh, um, master exhibitors and ads from, from breeders across the country. Sure. You know, I've also found that some of the breed clubs can be really helpful. They can. I, I don't, I think the Spanish are in enough trouble that there isn't a Spanish breed club anymore, but there is a Mediterranean breed club that you yeah. can join that, that encompasses the Menorcas and the Spanish and the Andalusians and Leghorns. And, and social media, actually. Facebook has been a really good tool. Mm -hmm. A lot of breeders are on Facebook. They'll post pictures of their birds. They'll, they'll uh, ask questions. They'll, they'll tell people what they have available. Yes. I know you're taking a rooster home uh, yes. for your for your Spanish. What, what is it that you like so much about Spanish? Well, they're a foundation breed, and and I have focused a lot on on Mediterranean breeds. And and what I like about him is, and the trouble that I'm having is getting a good white face mm. that extends below the wattles, and it that it ex is all the way around the eye. Right, the long bib drops below the wattle. Yes, yes, and. <laughs> I, I, this is a white egg layer, and white egg layers are in real trouble in this country because pe too many people associate white eggs with store eggs, All right. and and everyone thinks that a farm egg is brown eggs, and we need more people to to research where they're buying their eggs and, and care less about shell color and more about how the birds are raised and how, how yeah. well they're taken care of. Well, that's a very good point for people to to not get so hung up about egg color and focus on the needs of these breeds. That's right. Yeah, very good. Looking forward to your new home, buddy. Why are we getting packed up? Okay. All right. Thanks, Ellen. After the break, counting your chickens after they hatch. You won't want to miss this. When you get into poultry, you realize there's so many different breeds, but did you know that many of them are actually threatened by extinction? Over 60 breeds of chickens, dozens of different breeds of ducks, geese, and turkeys, well, they're all threatened. Take this giant Dewlap Toulouse Goose. What a name, don't you think? A great old French breed, but so few people raise them anymore. It's just an example of birds that are threatened. The American Livestock Conservancy is dedicated to raising the awareness of not only these breeds of poultry that are threatened, but other livestock as well. Jeanette Barringer, the Senior Program Manager of the Livestock Conservancy, is reaching out to farmers, hobbyists, hatcheries, and anyone else who's breeding the various forms of poultry. Jeanette, this is one of my favorite breeds. This is, of course, a, a light Sussex. 
Mm -hmm. Isn't she a great girl? Oh yeah, she's got a lot of substance to her, and this is the kind of kind of work we like to see getting done with the chickens that they're you know to breed standard. And she's heavy. This is going to make a mighty fine table bird. Yeah, the Livestock Conservancy has been um, in existence for now over 40 years. Yeah, next year will be 40 years. 40 will it be? Yeah. Okay, coming yeah. up. That's wonderful. Well, you guys do such great work. I think raising awareness about some of these endangered breeds, mm -hmm. not only poultry but a lot of mammalian species of livestock. Oh, sure. All, all the all the common livestock uh, and poultry species that are kept on American farms we work with, and the what's important about the breeds we work with is should they go away, the foundation that was used to create that breed no longer exists. Yeah. And that's actually quite important for everybody, whether you're raising birds or not. Most of agriculture is commercial you know, at this point, and they use very few breeds. Yes. And when you breed the best of the best of the best, year after year after year, guess what? They're related to each at, other. With a very narrow genome. Yes. And you know, when the genetic problems creep in, you know, who are you gonna call? Yeah, it's, right. It's the these guys. You got to come back to the originals. Absolutely. And it's kind of like managing a stock portfolio. You don't put your stock all into just one item. One thing, a right. A diversified portfolio is always the way to go. And that's how we explain the importance of this. What are some of the other things that the Livestock Conservancy is doing, maybe in the way of um, just keeping up with numbers? Uh, well, we do censusing, uh, both of poultry and livestock, mm -hmm. and that's a pretty hefty project. I because, can imagine. Especially with poultry, because, you know, they don't register chickens or, or geese. <laughs> right. um, so it's uh, through our networks that we're able to reach out to people, and we don't just count hatchery birds. We, we try to reach out to private individuals, Farms the breed like clubs. One. Farms like this, yeah. um, universities, there's some universities with very important flocks out there. So when you learn that a certain breed is critically endangered, mm -hmm. then awareness can be raised and people can rally to the support of that particular breed. Yeah, so part, part of the power of our networking abilities is that when we find a breed that really needs help, yeah. we can get people excited about it sure. and try and identify people that would be good partners and good stewards and build from there. And, um, you know, it takes time it and does. everybody wants to save things right away. But <laughs> it does as we talked about, you know, production selection and making sure you're breeding the right birds, yes. it can take years to it recover can. a breed. <laughs> yeah, well thank you for being here at the farm and taking oh, a look pleasure. at our, our collection of chickens. Uh, I can talk chickens all day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're such a good girl. Yes, you're doing very well on camera. <laughs> Coming up next, how certain kitchen scraps can provide extra nutrients to your garden soil. You know, we've all heard it before. Take those kitchen scraps like eggshells, coffee grounds, and put it out in the garden to give it a boost. Well, certainly soil is the foundation of the garden. And believe me, fertilizers and soil additives can drastically change your soil if used properly. The key is used properly. Certainly these eggshells and coffee grounds from this morning's coffee can be a part of the process of creating a really good compost for your plants, but there's a lot more to it than just throwing it out there in the garden. So let's look more closely at a few of these common things around the kitchen, like eggshells. When they're dried and ground into a powder, they can add extra calcium. Then take coffee. The grounds slowly release small amounts of potassium, phosphorus, nitrogen, and other minerals into the soil, while also being unpleasant to some pests. Of course, my advice to anyone who's considering making major changes to your soil profile is just to do a soil test as a starter. But all along the way, continue to, well, not throw these valuable little bits away. Integrate them into your composting program because they will improve your soil over time. And when you improve your soil, 
you're going to improve the beauty and performance of your garden. When we return, we're taking a closer look at one of my favorite heritage breeds. Carla, I think they're loving that green grass. Oh, they sure are after being in the car for nine hours. <laughs> well, they made the journey up here beautifully. These are gorgeous girls. Well, thank you, thank you. You know, the silver spangled Appenzeller Spitzhaben, which is a real mouthful to say. Most people say Gesundheit. <laughs> <laughs> well, they've become more and more popular, haven't they? They have. Yeah, and what do you attribute that popularity to? Is it just sort of the backyard chicken craze or? Their beauty, their yeah. majestic, and I think more people, as more people see them, they want them. Yeah. And that's exactly what happened to me the first time I saw them. <laughs> I fell in you love. You caught the bug. I did. I really well, did. Well, I, I do know that when people visit our farm and they see ours, they love them because they are so striking. Mm hmm Yeah. So the name Spitzhaben comes from this little crest, doesn't it? Exactly. Um, they come from the Appenzeller region of Switzerland. Yeah. And the Spitzhaben is a ceremonial hat that the Swiss women wear. Ah. And, uh, this kind of reflects it where it goes up and then over their, their nose like that. Yeah, and yeah, that's yeah. what you're looking for. One thing that's unique about them are their ear, blue earlobes. Yes, yes, that very one. stylish. And another thing they're known for is their nostrils. They're very cavernous and, and prominent. So aside from beauty, let's talk a little bit about this bird as a bird of utility because yours lay lots of eggs. They do. Um, right now they're laying more than my other breeds mm. and they seem to lay most of the year. Yeah, um, right. Don't mind the cold weather. Don't mind the cold weather. I, I guess there's Swiss <laughs> origins. <laughs> yes. They've gotten used to it. And even though they're a Swiss bird um, and used to the uh, the colder regions, mm. they're a, a little bit lighter bird. They don't have the heavy feathers and everything, so they adapt well to the heat. Right, right. And of course, they're wearing their little hat, so that, yes. that gives them a little shade in the summer and keeps them warm in the winter. I didn't think about that, but you're absolutely <laughs> right. Now, Carla, in this movement to conserve heritage birds, uh, the Appenzell or Spitzhaben is really a bird now that has moved past the critical or threatened list and, and now is in pretty good shape. Exactly, they are. Um, there's a few more varieties now than there were mm -hmm. and I think that's also helped. Would this be a breed you'd recommend to someone for a backyard flock? Oh yeah, Def yeah definitely. Mm -hmm. um, just like any other birds, uh, they can be tamed. If you don't handle them, you know, at an early age, then they're going to be a little bit more skittish. Sure, right. The but, more custom they are to you, the calmer they'll be. Exactly. Yeah. And one thing that I found um, as I was breeding the birds was that the ro roosters were very non-aggressive. Mm. I never had an, uh, an aggressive rooster. The only time they would even make any type of a fuss is if you picked up one of the hens and right. she fussed a little bit, then the rooster would come up, run up to me and then you put her down. It's like, we're cool, well, and walk away. Can't blame a guy for trying to defend his own. <laughs> I, I know, I know. And I, I was never afraid to turn my back on him. Well, Carla, thank you for the great work you're doing on this breed. It's really important work, and it's a pleasure to have you here at the farm. Well, thank you. Want to learn more? Visit pallensmith.com for delicious recipes, garden tips, blog posts, and our online store. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed visiting this poultry show as much as I have. Hey, if you want to help support some of these breeds, there's several ways you can do it. One is to join an organization like the Livestock Conservancy or support a local farmer. That's a big help. And the other, well, you just might be a little adventurous and jump in and start raising a breed in need yourself. Well, until next time, I'm Alan Smith.